Thank you very much, Claire. Good morning uh, to all. It's my pleasure to open the second day of the conference with a session focusing on monetary policy cycles. I am pleased to introduce uh, uh, Christine Forbes. You are a veteran of Sintma. You have been here from the very beginning, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Christine will present her work on rate cycles, summarized in an extremely rich paper covering 55 years of data from 24 advanced economies, and what we can learn from uh, this cross-country historical comparison of easing and tightening of cases. Her paper will be discussed by Paolo, Paolo Surico, professor at the London Business School. Well, you know perfectly, you know the house uh, keeping rules. Christine, you have 25 minutes. You can take the floor now without any further ado, and afterwards you will have 15 minutes, Paolo. So, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about rate cycles. This is joint work with John Grimha and Ihan Koz. Please raise your hand, say hello. Uh, they'd be delighted to answer questions at the end also. So the uh, goal of this paper is to answer the question how today's monetary policy cycle fits in the historical context. And we hoped that after answering that question, we would then be able to answer what the implications are for monetary policy today. So to tackle these questions, we bring together two very different methodologies and approaches. First, we're gonna draw from the very extensive literature on business cycles to analyze what we call rate cycles. So similar to how business cycles have phases of expansion and contraction, or credit cycles have booms and busts, we're gonna look at what we call tightening and easing cycles based on a country's policy interest rates and its asset purchase programs. And using this, we can look at 24 advanced economies for 55 years and identify a series of tightening and easing phases which together make rate cycles. And this is a neat new database across countries, across time, to try to put today's monetary policy cycle in a broader historical context. But this only gets you so far. It gives you all sorts of neat patterns and characteristics and trends that you can talk about but it doesn't tell you why cycles have changed over time. So then we have another big section of the paper which tries to understand why rate cycles have changed over time and what drives them. And to do this, we draw on a rich factor augmented VAR analysis, which allows us to decompose the drivers of these interest rate movements over time and across countries. And what's great about this very rich data set on a monthly uh, frequency is that we can break out in even more detail than, say, the paper we saw yesterday, what the drivers are. We not only look at demand versus supply shocks, which was a subject of debate yesterday, but we can break out global demand, global supply from the domestic demand, domestic supply versus monetary policy shocks and oil shocks. So a very rich decomposition. So what do we find? We hoped we would be able to get up here and say, this cycle today looks just like this cycle in year X. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. What we found is when we look at this long cross-country uh, track record of rate cycles, there really is no one cycle that is directly comparable today. Instead, it is more like the parable of the blind men and the elephant. Uh, according to this parable, a group of blind men are introduced to this new and exotic beast, but they're only allowed to touch one part of this new and exotic animal. And depending on which perspective they take, which angle they take, they come up with very different conclusions on what this animal is like. For example, the blind man that touches the trunk says, it's like a snake. The blind man that touches the leg says, it's like a tree, and so on. Similarly, when we try to categorize today's monetary policy cycle, the one that is most, uh, the best comparison really depends on your perspective. So more specifically, by some characteristics and some perspectives, this pandemic rate cycle, the cycle from 2020 to 2024, is unprecedented. It was the largest swings in a number of macro variables than we have ever seen. The uh, tightening response was a bit slower than has historically uh, occurred based on the macro data, but then it was followed by the most synchronized uh, period of rate increases in the history of our data. It, this was also then followed by the longest period at which rates were on hold at their peak in any historic rate cycle, so that as a result, today's rate cycle now has largely normalized, and most macro variables look about where they would look 
uh, during historic rate cycles, despite these unprecedented moves in between. When you look at the drivers of this rate cycle, it was also unprecedented, the role of global shocks, not only an unprecedented role of global supply shocks, but also an unprecedented role of global demand shocks in driving rate movements during the pandemic cycle. So in those ways, the cycle was unprecedented. But then based on some other characteristics, this cycle was just like some historic cycles. For example, uh, the, path, the aggressive path of rate increases by number of measures was very similar to pre-2008 tightening cycles, including where the level of interest rates is sort of settled at this point in the cycle. Also, the cycle was similar to historic cycles in the, fact, in the sense that demand shocks appear to have driven more of the movements uh, than other sources of, of the rate cycle. Um, and finally, from another perspective, if you take a step back from the elephant and compare this rate cycle over a longer historic period, focus on longer trends instead of shorter windows, this rate cycle looks like just a continuation of some longer term, slower moving trends. In particular, over time, we've seen a larger role for global factor in driving interest rates. It's increased even more in terms of explaining interest rates than driving business cycles or inflation cycles. And we see an increased role for global shocks over time, and especially a larger role for global demand shocks in driving cycles over time. So based on your perspective, this cycle is unprecedented, just like some historic experiences, or just a continuation of longer term trends. Um, so it, what do we do in this paper? This paper, there is a lot in this paper, if you've had a chance to look at it. I'm only going to be able to touch the surface today. What I'm going to do is just give you some highlights from each of the sections, a little bit more on the methodology, especially how we define the rate cycles, and then a little bit more on the shocks driving the cycles. But I'm going to go through some of this quickly, again, just a sample of what's in the paper to hopefully whet your interest and have you look at more of the details, and then save some time at the end to focus on a results based on historic comparisons of how you exit a rate cycle, how long you hold rates constant, when countries have exited prematurely and had to go back and took patterns of divergence leading up to some implications for monetary policy today. Okay, let me jump right in. Key part of the paper is our new definitions of rate cycles. So how do we identify rate cycles? We start by drawing on a standard methodology in the business cycle literature, the BBQ algorithm, which identifies peaks and troughs and measures of activity. But then we set parameters so we allow for long cycles, as we've had some very long easing cycles post-2008. But we also allow for short phases when countries can adjust policy aggressively over a short period. Um, well, one big issue when identifying rate cycles is there's long periods where rates are constant. You don't get that in when you identify business cycles. So we do have to make some tweaks to the algorithm, and we also incorporate asset purchases as easing. So when interest rates are on hold at lower bounds, if you do asset purchase programs, that counts as easing. So we pull this all together um, for our 24 advanced economies. We're going to look at a period from 1970 through May of 2024. So we stopped right before a few countries started lowering interest rates. Uh, the, that will not be in our, our sample. Um, one uh, technical issue important for this room, for the euro area, we treat individual members of the euro area as having individual rate cycles through 1998. And then we look at the euro area as a whole based on the rates set by the ECB in our calculation of rate cycles. So pull it all together, we get this neat data set of rate cycles with 212 distinct easing and tightening phases. And we hope that one contribution to the paper is that we'll publish this, this database of rate cycles and there's all sorts of different analyses and comparisons and things you can do um, with this, what we think is the first systematic analysis of cross country 55 years of rate cycles across countries. So how do they what do they look like in practice? I will show you an example from the ECB, not just because it is our host, but also it is the shortest time series, so the easiest one to look at. Um, so here's what we do for each country in this sample. We graph the policy interest rate in black, and then the purple is the identified start of tightening cycles, the red is the start of easing cycles, the orange is the announcement of major QE programs, and the blue is the announcement of QT programs. And so ECB has had three tightening cycles, the most recent starting in uh, 2022, has hit two easing cycles, including a very long one starting in 2008 and going through the pandemic. Um, what's neat is if you track these turning points of the cycles with historic narratives of changes in monetary policy, they fit quite well. 
For example, this fits quite well, the very nice narrative of the history of the ECB's monetary policy written by Philip Hartman and presented at Sintra a couple of years ago. Um, one other thing to just point out for the ECB, you see this little hump in 2011 when the ECB raised rates twice and then quickly reversed course. So in our sample, that does not qualify as a rate cycle because it was reversed so quickly. Instead, in our database, that will count as a preliminary adjustment where a country tried to adjust rates and get out of the cycle and had to reverse course. We have a whole analysis in the paper about preliminary adjustments, their incidence, what causes them, macro patterns. I probably won't get that to that today, but happy to answer questions on it in the Q&A. So that's the ECB. In some sense, that's the easiest one in our sample. Just to give you a, a contrast, the country with the most rate phases in our sample is the US. You see a lot more rate phases early in the sample. Um, one thing I just want to point out about the US is if you see the graph of the policy interest rates in black, the lines look quite different early in the sample. And this capture is typical in many countries because monetary policy regimes were very different in the 70s and 80s. A lot more volatility in rates. In the US, there was a period they were targeting the money supply more than rates. Um, but what's great about this algorithm and this setup we've put together is that it does a pretty good job defining turning points in rate cycles even across different monetary policy regimes and targets and tools. Um, Okay, I could show you graphs like that all day. They're fun to look at. They're in the back of the paper. Um, instead, the point of it, though, is to then look at the characteristics of these rate cycles. So next, we look at a series of sort of standard characteristics from the business cycle literature on these rate cycles. And then we can do all sorts of fun comparisons in how they com com compare across countries, across easing and tightening phases, et cetera. So lots of graphs in the paper of things like this for anyone who likes, likes random facts. Uh, easing or tightening phases on average are quite a bit shorter than easing phases. Tightening phases last an average of 49 months. Easing phases last an average of about almost 80 months. So lots of facts like that. Um, but what I'm going to do is skip over a lot of them and just focus on the results we have for how the characteristics of these phases have changed over time. So let me jump to that. I have a bunch of graphs like this. We're going to focus on five different time periods. Uh, the first two were before the creation of the ECB, the rest after. The red is the most recent pandemic uh, rate cycle. And we look at some of these standard characteristics of rate cycles across the five periods. Easing phases on the right, tightening on the left. What you see for easing phases, and we have a lot more uh, data on this in the paper, is there's not a lot of patterns. Easing phases have sort of evolved in some ways, but it's not a consistent pattern since 1970. In contrast, tightening phases show a very distinct pattern, whatever statistic you look at. Tightening phases have become more muted over time. Less rate hikes, slower pace of rate hikes initially and overall, slower overall in increase in rates during tightening cycles until the pandemic cycle. During the pandemic, uh, tightening cycle became more aggressive again and more typical of historic rate cycles. Um, and that is also true when you look at what happened to policy interest rates. So this, this is the graph of the median policy interest rate in our sample for the five different periods. Red, again, is the pandemic cycle. Rates started lower than at any historic cycle, but then were raised aggressively. So they've sort of settled and bounced around what is typical of pre-2008 rate cycles. Um, and the big question then is, of course, will they settle around there or move uh, lower, more similar to the post-2008 cycles? Um, then we look at a number of macro variables around these rate cycles. Again, focusing on the five different periods. Each line, again, different period. Red is the pandemic cycle. Uh, we look at a range of macro variables, inflation variables. Here's a sample of four. Whatever variables you look at, the, uh, oh, and T equals zero is the start of tightening phases. Um, so T equals zero is about 2021 or 2022, whenever each country started raising rates uh, for the red line. Um, and what you see is whatever variable you look at, activity was stronger in the year before the first rate hike in the post-pandemic cycle. So the rate hikes did start slower than they traditionally do during historic rate cycles. But then what's interesting is you see this aggressive path of rate hikes meant that each macro variable has gradually normalized, slower for inflation than the other variables, so that each macro variable has now roughly settled around where it would be at this stage in a historic rate cycle. So even if central banks did start a little slow, 
they were aggress so aggressive in their heights and holds that most macro variables have largely normalized, but that is consistent with interest rates largely settling at a higher level than has, has, has occurred, occurred since 2008. So those are just some of the patterns we find in the data. Now the next task is understanding what drives these cycles. What's behind them, what's behind the patterns over time. So we start by looking at a number of patterns of synchronization of rate cycles over time. This is one graph which shows the share of economies increasing rates in blue, share decreasing rates or doing asset purchase programs in red. You see these waves. The waves suggest that there's some periods where rate adjustments are highly synchronized, where a lot of countries in the sample are doing the same thing. And it particularly jumps out at you as not just a wave, it's more like a tsunami in the most recent rate cycle, where the largest share of economies were raising interest rates at the same time that has ever occurred. Every country in our sample is raising rates except Japan. Um, but there's other periods where you have quite a bit of divergence, different countries adjusting rates in different directions. So what explains these patterns, and especially these patterns where you get highly synchronized rate changes? So to analyze this, we use a couple different methodologies. We do a dynamic factor model. We find that the global factor in interest rate movements has grown quite sharply over time, even more so than for inflation and growth. Um, but what I'm going to focus on is a set of results from our factor augmented VAR. So this is sort of all the bells and whistles and the latest technology. Um, but based on a rich data set, we're able to really break down the shocks driving interest rate movements. And we're going to look at four global shocks, global demand, global supply, global monetary policy, and oil prices. Um, when I talk about oil prices, just to be clear, that can also include movements in natural gas prices and other commodity prices, such as the ones that moved quite sharply after the Ukraine invasion, if those prices move in the same direction as oil prices. And then we can also look at the standard domestic shocks. So we're going to look at uh, what drives, uh, and I'm going to focus on the results for what drives interest rates based on the shock decomposition. So let me first uh, focus on some aggregate results. Yesterday we had quite a bit of discussion of how much of it's global versus domestic. So here's what we found in our estimates. When you break down the seven shocks, and now we'll just again, the four global ones and three domestic ones, the role of global shocks is in blue, domestic shocks in gray, and you see the role of global shocks has been steadily increasing over time. So that in the most recent rate cycle, global shocks explained over 50% of the variation in interest rates. The first time we can ever say that, the first time global shocks were more important than domestic shocks in explaining interest rate movements. If you just focus on the post-pandemic tightening, the role was even larger, explaining 75% of the rate increases post-pandemic. So global shocks matter and matter more and more over time. But what global shocks matter? Now, we had a lot of discussion yesterday about is it supply, is it demand, because that could have different implications for monetary policy. So now this is the more detailed decomposition of the drivers of these rate movements over the five periods into the seven shocks. The bottom four are global, the top three are domestic. And again, you see the increased role of the global shocks, and now you see why. Global shocks played a greater role than they have at any time in history. So the focus on supply shocks makes sense. They were more important, and they were even more important in the Euro area than any other country in our sample. So this shows the, the mean across our sample. Um, again, there is some important divergence. Um, but what also jumps out at you is that while global shocks played a greater role than they have historically, global demand shocks played an even greater role. So this is, agrees with some of the results from yesterday, that while well, supply shocks, oil shocks were important, demand shocks were still more important overall on average across the sample. Um, so, so that's our breakdown of what drives these cycles. Now let's shift to the, the big issue on the minds of central bankers is how do you exit a cycle? This is always a challenge, even during normal periods. You have to assess the effects of interest rate changes that are in place. You have to make a forecast, which is always a challenge, and you have to assess how much, uh, how, uh, much restrictiveness is in the current state of monetary policy. All hard. So what can we learn from history about exiting a rate cycle? To analyze this, we start by looking at the time that central banks typically hold rates on hold at the end of a rate cycle. Um, and we define on hold as no change in interest rates and having stopped all asset purchase programs. So let's start with the easing phases. Someone jumps out at you. Uh, this easing, this phase after the pandemic was the shortest period when rates were on hold that has ever occurred historically. 
on uh, the median uh, country in our sample had rates on hold for only three months from when they ended cutting rates, ended asset programs, until they, their first rate hike. Uh, what also jumps out uh, is the length of the hold on the tightening end. After tightening rates and raising rates uh, after the pandemic, rates have now been on hold uh, for a meeting in our sample of almost 10 months. That is the longest period at which rates have been on hold of any historic tightening cycles. Um, and that makes sense. After the aggressive easing, it, central banks wanted to wait to have more time to assess the effects on the economy. So then what happens after holds? So then we analyze uh, how, uh, what the pattern is of exits. I mean, here's a neat graph to sort of capture big picture what is going on. So the blue is the share of countries in a tightening phase. The light blue is the share of that phase that rates are on hold before you shift to easing. The red is the share of countries in an easing phase. The light red is the share on hold at the end of easing phases. So there's a lot there, but let's just, in the interest of comparisons for today, focus on the patterns for tightening phases in blue. So what you see is there's been a few periods similar to today where most of the sample are tightening policy. And then typically, after these mountains where you have most of the sample tightening policy, what we call highly synchronized tightening phases, then you have this sort of blue glacier on the side of the mountain. The blue glacier, though, is usually pretty small and pretty fragmented. And what that shows is typically when you have these highly synchronized tightening periods, you then get this short period where some countries are on hold, some countries keep raising rates, and some start cutting rates, and you get quite a bit of divergence, um, and then a majority of countries shift to easing. This uh, period, again, stands out a bit in the steepness of the backside of the slope and the size of the holding period. And it, that captures the fact that, un, in somewhat unusually, you have almost all countries raising rates, then almost all countries shifting to holding rates constant. And it's only now we're starting to shift to more divergence, where some countries are starting to cut, some are still holding, and who knows if some will start raising again. So next, what we want to do is take a closer look at the exits, the exits from these big mountains. What can we say about exits from these past highly synchronized tightening periods that might be relevant to today? So when you look at the pattern of exits from previous highly synchronized tightening periods, um, here what we graph is zero is the start of the synchronized tightening, and then the dot is, represents the date or the month when each country did its first rate cut. And the first thing that jumps out at you is substantial divergence. There's often quite a long period between the first rate cut in one country versus when uh, the last country starts cutting rates. So it wouldn't be surprising to see, again, substantial divergence this time around. What also jumps out at you, though, is the red. The red is the timing of the US first rate cut. And the red is usually at the front of the pack. So the US is often, but not always, a first mover in terms of rate cuts after highly synchronized tightening. The only period that looks something like what might transpire today is the tightening cycle that started in 1979 and 1980. And that's similar to this cycle in some ways when that was another period where oil shocks played a big role. Um, and after that synchronized tightening period, four countries lowered rates before the US. So we took a closer look at that episode to try to analyze who cut rates first, who was slower to cut rates, what determines the timing of exit from these synchronized tightening periods. And what we find is your level of activity usually doesn't correspond to when you start lowering rates. What matters more is your level of inflation. Countries with lower inflation tend to be the ones to exit earlier and cut rates first, particularly before the US. And that also seems to apply quite well to today. OK, um, I probably will not have time to talk about premature adjustments. Let me just jump to some summary. So we cover a lot of ground in this paper. This is just a sample of some of the results in there. For those of you who like these sorts of statistics and graphs, I encourage you to take a look, especially a lot of country, um, a lot of implications for different countries. I've also focused only on the medians and means across countries, and there are some important differences across countries. Um, but also let me, before I summarize, highlight what we don't do. We do not look at uh, changes in the monetary policy stance. We focus, our rate cycle measure focuses on changes in policy rates and asset purchase programs. We do that primarily to focus on the main measures that central banks use today, 
but also because these are easy to measure for 55 years and give us this rich data set. Um, measuring the neutral rate and overall stance of monetary policy is another whole set of issues as we will hear about later today. Also, we do not adjust for differences in monetary policy tools and frameworks over time. We do talk some about how changes in frameworks may affect some of the rate cycle characteristics, but we use the same methodology throughout the longer history. We also only focus on advanced economies, cycles in emerging markets could be quite different. Okay, so that's what we don't do. What do we do? Let's go back to the elephant. Uh, how does this rate cycle compare to historic cycles? It does compare or depend on your perspective. There's no one historic rate cycle just like today. In many ways, this rate cycle is unprecedented. The magnitude of the economic moves, uh, the coordinated uh, tightening of rates, the time rates were on hold is unprecedented. But in some ways, this rate cycle is very similar to pre-2008 cycles. The path of tightening, the level where interest rates are stabilizing, where other variables are stabilizing, looks a lot like the 2008 period. Um, but also, the cycle reflects slower moving changes over time, particularly the greater role of global shocks global supply, and especially global demand in driving rate movements. So the answer of what's the best perspective, it's sort of all of the above. So what's that mean for policy? Um, a number of implications, I will focus on three. First, as central bankers think about the future rate adjustments, any future rate adjustments, barring a major shock, obviously, should be cautious and gradual. There is uncertainty about what this rate cycle will look like. What is the best historic precedent? If this rate cycle continues to look more like the pre-2008 cycles, especially where interest rates are, that may mean rates may not need to be adjusted very much. We'll discuss that in more detail in the panel again later today, but it does suggest that the neutral rate may have moved up quite a bit. Also, the results based on the shocks behind rate movements suggest that while central banks will obviously um, adjust based on domestic circumstances, we're likely to see more divergence in rate movements over the next period as we shift away from this highly synchronized tightening phase um, uh, to the next stage. Second key result is that monetary policy decisions will be increasingly driven by global shocks. Central bankers will focus on, obviously, domestic inflation, or uh, activity based on their domestic mandates. But in that context, global shocks matter more and more. So the backdrop will be a greater role of global shocks in driving interest rate movements. And finally, um, it, what this also suggests is that it's going to be increasingly important to differentiate behind the drivers of the global shocks. There is a tendency to sometimes equilibrate a global shock as a supply shock. And that has certain implications for monetary policy. We can tend to look through it more. There may have been that misperception during the pandemic when there was so much attention to the supply shocks. There may have been a tendency to think global meant supply, so you didn't have to respond as forcefully with monetary policy. But what we've seen is global demand shocks also play a greater role. So it is increasingly important going forward to differentiate between how much of a global shock is demand how much is supply, because that will have first-order implications for the appropriate path for policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. <clears throat> Paolo, now you have the floor. You have almost dovetailed. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and uh, to discuss this uh, uh, very nice paper. So Christine did an excellent job uh, in summarizing it. So let me use just one slide to give you the WWW of the contribution. Why, what, and so what. So what this paper does, look at difference and similarity among monetary policy cycle across 24 countries over about 55 years. Why? Because this time feels different. They use a factor model to identify global regularity and then they plug these into a structural vector autoregression to try to interpret them. What do they find? Look, over time, the monetary policy cycle has become more synchronized across country. Expansion phases of the cycle have, to be, have become, have last longer than tightening one. And yes, indeed, this time is different. There has been an unprecedented uh, 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 coordination both in tightening and holding. And there has been an increased role for global supply shock, but their view is that global demand shock is still dominant. 
My assessment is also a WWW. Wow, this was impressive, very nice descriptive evidence. So let me try to contribute to the discussion by bringing my own elephants to the table. And by the way, this was totally uncoordinated. We figured it out last, uh, last afternoon that we were both after elephants. Let me divide between good elephant, which I'm gonna call wages, bad elephant, which is inflation services, and the ugly elephants in the room, which I think is fiscal policy. And to play the same game that Christian and co-author have, have done, I'm gonna tie my hands to use the same statistical tools, principal component, and the same international panel as the author. This is the principal component of CPI inflation and nominal wage growth. Remember, those are the mean and standardized. So read nothing about the level other than above zero means above average, below zero means below average. The red line refers to CPI inflation, the dotted black refers to wages. First point to notice, the 70. Very high above average inflation. Wages are very much synchronized. This really seems prima facie evidence of wage price spiral. When wages goes down, inflation goes down. But look now at the recent cycle. Despite CPI inflation being above average, wages have not. And if anything, the correlation is sharply negative. Wages are picking up later than CPI. In fact, if anything, wages are responding to inflation. So that's why in the picture, this is an elephant, but it's not distracting the two central bankers on the sofa that can still make their job. Compare now this with the bad elephant, the one that is disrupted the room. Let's look at now service inflation. It now becomes very difficult because different countries have different time series. So the US on the left since the, the 60, uh, the United Kingdom since 89, the euro area for the more uh, recent uh, uh, period, and this is indeed the principal component. For the euro area, the headline inflation in red and the black dotted line is services inflation. Let's start with previous recession. And look at this, those are three separate recessions. The 70 for the US, the 89-92 exchange rate mechanism for the UK, and the financial crisis for the euro area. But they all share a sharp regularity. Service inflation globally and headline inflation are synchronized. They peak at the same time and they come down at the same time. But this recession is different. Service inflation peak between six months and one year later. This implies that there is a period in which service inflation is going up while headline inflation is going down. So actually, in fact, there must be negative inflation to compensate for that movement. This is consistent with the structural reallocation story that Lucrezia, Silvana, and Veronica Guerrieri have showed us that could have some bite for the recent episodes. There are some sectors that are becoming more productive. There is a shift in the labor force toward those sectors. There is an impressive in wages demand. Do you remember this match what I showed you in the previous graph, that wages are raising when headline inflation is going down. So still is a bad elephant because means services and inflation might be more persistent than we thought, but it's not as bad as we think because if this is a, a better allocation of capital, then monetary policy can afford to be more accommodative of what we would have otherwise done. Unfortunately, however, there is a very ugly elephant and you can see for how painful it is for the central banker in the picture. What you see as a red line is the principal component of CPI inflation, and as a blue line is the principal component of GDP growth. The dotted black line is the first principal component of fiscal deficit. A first point to notice. In the 70, fiscal deficit has been on average. So I don't think we can explain the 70 inflation with fiscal sustainability. Look, however, the great financial crisis of 2007-2009. GDP growth goes well below average, and fiscal deficit becomes expansionary, very much below average. Then, however, there is the austerity, and despite the slow recovery, look at the fiscal deficit that shrink actually become a fiscal surplus. 
slow recovery becomes even slower, but look on the right chart, there is no inflation. Contrast this now with the 2020-2024 cycle. The fiscal deficit expansion, it is as big, if not bigger, much below average than during the financial crisis. However, because of the pent-up demand, the output loss is much lower, is much lower, if anyone, relative to the global financial crisis. And still, fiscal deficit is below average. This is the denominator that is growing a lot because of pent-up demand, but the denominator of the fiscal deficit to GDP ratio is not moving. There is no austerity. There is a soft landing, but CPI is picking up. Remember that monetary policy in the two cycles has also been very different. Accommodative monetary policy was much more prolonged during the financial crisis, in the aftermath of it, than it has been now. So yesterday, Jordi was saying, how about if the aggregate demand has rotated because of accommodative monetary policy this time? And Giorgio pointed out that, if anything, monetary policy has been more accommodative in the aftermath of the financial crisis rather than the pandemic. So my challenge for you, Jordi, is how about if the rotation in the aggregate demand is due to accommodative fiscal policy rather than monetary policy? There is a lot of discussion, policymaker, academics, what would have happened if interest rates were cut six months earlier? Look, but they were low for longer after the financial crisis. My instinct is that cutting interest rates six months earlier would have not made such a big difference. However, the question for you is, would tighten fiscal policy? If fiscal policy would have tightened six months ago, would have inflation been different? In other words, President Lagarde, Governor Bailey, is there not here perhaps a trade-off on the one hand between slow recovery and no inflation, and on the other hand, soft lending and high inflation? Could it be that the trade-off faced by monetary policy is fiscal in nature? You might say, okay, those are correlation. Let's distinguish them from causality. So I'm going to rely on my own research to do this in the next slide. Tom Sargent said that the virus was the Third World War because it was a common enemy, because the size and breadth of government spending was as large as during the war. Just to give things in perspective, the Marshall Plan was 4% of the US GDP in 1948. The US, the UK, and the Euro area public spending has been enormously larger than that. So here I'm using US data for 125 years of data in a joint paper with a fantastic, another fantastic PhD student. We are very lucky to have a London Business School, and it's going to be on the market next year. <laughs> we use government spending instrumented by Ramey military spending news. So this is not more its war shock that destroy a country. This is an exogenous movement in government spending for a war happening somewhere else. Government spending peak for four years, and then it goes to pre-shock level. This is finance with debt, as you see in the fiscal deficit coming in the middle chart. But look at the right panel. This is the impulse responses of log prices. So this is the slope of these impulse responses is inflation. Inflation in the first four years, which is as much as the fiscal expansion last, increased by 0.5% for a shock that has the size 1% of GDP. Let me make a back of the envelope calculation. Euro area government uh, public spending has increased by 6.5% in 2020. According to our estimate, this has contributed between 2.5 and 4% of Euro area inflation between 2022 and 2023. One third of Euro area inflation. In UK, and in the US, where fiscal expansion has been even larger, we go closer to 50%. So my question is, is government expanding inflationary or not? What we show in that paper, that depends on the composition. The beauty of, is a terrible word, beauty, I apologize for that, of military spending, is that he has a composition of government consumption, government investment, but above all, tilt government spending towards public R&D. So in the short run, 
government consumption act quickly and move output and inflation in the same direction. Oh, this is a different one. I wanted to point it out. Uh, you see in the first part of the horizon, output goes up and prices goes up. So it looks like a demand shock because this is mostly government consumption. But in the long run, the, the investment in public R&D take it over. There was DARPA during the, the war. Ten years later, we have internet. There was uh, the Manhattan Project. Fifteen years, we have nuclear energy. There is moon shooting. Ten years later, we have GPS. So when fiscal policy is tilted towards public R&D, this looks like in the long run a supply shock because push up productivity and bring inflation down. So what is my bottom line? What has been the legacy of the 70 inflation? A few years later, the theory in practice, or better, the practice and theory of inflation targeting came about as a legacy of the 70 inflation. Then the financial crisis occurred, and what has been the legacy of that? Take it seriously, the financial sector, and bring in banking into our model, into our framework. I wonder what's going to be the legacy of uh, the pandemic crisis. Let me tell you my wish, if not a legacy, that we abolish this demand and supply shock decomposition, that we stop orthogonalizing short run and long run. I don't think it's useful. I think actually it's been very confusing during this crisis. If I look at the res recent inflation episodes, I see three factors, three large movements. Energy prices, structural reallocation, and fiscal policy. Two thirds of those explanations are both supply and demand and affect both the short run and the long run, especially in countries in the UK in which the recent increase in public spending has been particularly shifted towards public R&D. So perhaps what we need to look at are two shocks that put inflation up and shocks that push up productivity. And in this small discussion, I've given two examples, structural reallocation and fiscal policy, that they do both. They push inflation up in the short run, and with the right composition of public spending, also put the productivity up in the long run. But then if you buy my interpretation, then the monetary policy responding of hiking interest rates first and then starting to cut now, then just perhaps it has been about right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paolo. I think that is very important to bring uh, the fiscal dimension to the discussion. I don't know whether you know this. Do you want to? Yeah, comment? sure. I, I, I have lots of thoughts always. Um, actually, I have a couple of comments. So, first, I think your addition of wages and services to some of these comparisons is super interesting. Um, we talked about what variables we focused on. We, uh, we look at GDP growth, IP growth, unemployment, employment growth, CPI inflation, and uh, core inflation, mainly because that's the best time series, monthly data back to 1970, and even those series are pretty spotty. If you go to wages and services, it's even harder. But I think yours is a nice supplement. If we want to do it on a lower frequency, you could work that in. Um, I, I like the way you broke out the role of government spending as a demand shock. So we do, we sort of go the next level, just cycle characteristics, and then these broad categories of shocks, we find big roles for demand shocks, but we don't say what those demand shocks are. We separate that from monetary, and yours is then the next level. A lot of demand shock is probably fiscal, so that's another sort of nice extension to explain these, this large role for demand shocks we have. Um, uh, so I think uh, you're, one important thing to highlight that might get missed for people who haven't <laughs> dug into all the details of this is some of your results were also of the role of these shocks in influencing GDP and inflation. We have all those results in our paper, but I didn't show those. The ones I focused were on how these shocks affect interest rates. And there are some periods where there are very big differences in how the shocks affect, say, inflation versus interest rates. So, um, for example, some of the disconnect we heard yesterday of what's the role of demand, what's the role of supply, supply shocks have a bigger role affecting inflation, a smaller role affecting interest rates as we look through some of the shocks to inflation. Um, so that's where there's also some, it, it's, it's something to just explore more and really be clear on is when you're looking at the role of shocks, what are you explaining? You get different roles for different shocks based on that left-hand side variable. 
Um, and then finally, I think your bottom line is also we just need to do a better job of explaining what's going on underneath. Yet the, the, using this sort of Favre decomposition, supply, demand, global supply, global demand, it's far from perfect. It's a lots of assumptions. It's a lot that goes into the guts of this for sure. Sometimes that matters. Some of the results, it doesn't matter. Um, but I fully agree, you know, ideally you'd like to then go another level and understand more. But our bottom line is we still need to do this decomposition because it does matter first order for setting policy. Um, but you're, you're sort of coming in the same place. We need to do a better job of understanding what, what's going on under the covers and that's where we need to go. Well, thank you very much, Christine. Uh, you know, I won't take advantage of my position. I will ask you one question. Yeah. Uh, I think that fiscal is key, uh, I agree with you. Uh, and we have seen as well uh, a very important deterioration of the fiscal profile uh, in Europe, in the US. Do you think that uh, fiscal could give rise in the future to any sort of fiscal dominance and affect uh, to the rate cycle? That is beyond the scope of our paper, for sure. I can give you my personal views. Um, I, 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 I have great faith in all the central bankers in this room that as long as they maintain independence, which we hope they will, they will stick to their targets and stick to their mandates. Uh, so I hope we will not be in a world of fiscal hope. dominance. Yes. Very good. My take is that there's nothing wrong about running a large fiscal deficit. The problem is that what you do with that. If you run large fiscal deficit to fund uh, public R&D, be my guest, this could pay themselves. If you f use a run large fiscal deficit for government consumption or for even industrial policy that we in our paper show, we show a strong inflationary effect in the short run and very little productivity gain in the long run, then I'm a little bit concerned. So it's not the, f the size of the fiscal deficit per se, but, but the what is what the composition. And to me, this is a, a, a critical message to take away. When I hear all those industrial, unspecified industrial policy, I'm, I'm worried this could be it's big demand shock in the short run, using the conventional terminology, and the little supply shock in the long run. What, and if I might go back, I can understand that it's very easy for communication, talk about demand and supply. But I really think that our focus is what moves inflation in the short run and what moves productivity in the long run. If you start to see history and our economic model through this land, then you go to the fundamentals. Okay, let's look at the composition of government spending. Let's look what is the impact of labor market on those two variables along these two dimensions. And then I think the job of monetary policy becomes easier to think about. And this was the message I wanted to try to put forward. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Paolo. Now the floor is open. I have, uh, you know, to Jordi. We'll start with Jordi, there, or whatever. Hmm? Okay, okay. Thank you. I thought this was a very interesting paper. There was one picture that you showed that I thought was absolutely fascinating, which is the <coughs> um, behavior of inflation around, around uh, interest rate cycles. For three of the sample periods, it was completely flat, and it only showed some you know, hum shaped for the most recent episode. The fact that it was completely flat for the you know, 99, 2000 episode, I think it's proof of success of monetary policy. The fact that it was hum shaped in the recent episode, it's proof that this was the first adverse supply shock in an inflation targeting period, and hence that, you know, there was some inflation that the central bank had to accommodate. But what I thought was uh, more uh, fascinating is the fact that it was completely flat in the earlier period, which shows that since we know that inflation fluctuated a lot, that monetary policy was completely orthogonal to inflation. Okay, so it, it, it gives a very interesting new perspective on the uh, literature on uh, monetary policy reaction functions from a very different uh, point of view. No? And just a quick comment on, on, on Paolo's uh, evidence. Is government spending inflationary well, I would say the answer to that question is not independent on, of how monetary policy reacts to government spending. Of when you use uh, empirical evidence with data going back to 1890, okay, so presumably monetary policy now is very different from what it was uh, before, as uh, their paper actually shows. And, and we do control for that, of sample analysis, exactly for that reason. 
I have uh, here Joaquin and there are two. You know, let's collect uh, three, three questions and we can respond afterwards. Joaquin. So, thank you very much for these excellent um, presentations. Let me come back to uh, the synchronization of monitor policy and your database. Over the last uh, 55 years, the world changed a lot. And I, I ask myself about the time consistency of this synchronization. Isn't that pretty much um, dependent on what happened over the last 55 years in terms of globalization? And could there be maybe now coming a kind of a, a new period where maybe deglobalization, we do not really know if that is the case, but take that assumption it could be, is now kicking in, and this might lead to further desynchronization. Maybe that's the question for you. And uh, maybe it's a more an observation over the last couple of two years. When inflation is getting above 10%, I have to admit, from a central banker perspective, it doesn't make too much difference if it is supply or demand driven. <laughs> Let's take another question there, and uh, you can respond afterwards. Yes, yeah, so, so fascinating paper, and... Uh, Please go to the, to the point. We have only sure, theoretically sure. two minutes. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd like you to go a step further. Uh, you know, the, the, the sharpness of the cycle now compared to earlier times, is it due to waking up from complacency or is it due to large shock? And that's something you could look at. So let me, let me juxtapose three chairmen here. I'm thinking Focal, I'm thinking Greenspan, and I'm thinking Lagarde, Power. Let me put them <coughs> both in the same basket. So when Powell came, when, when, sorry, when Volcker came in, inflation was rampant, and Volcker said, I have to do something, and sharply increased interest rates. So th that sharp cycle was a result of complacency of monetary policy before. Greenspan was always applauded for being ahead of the game and doing things in monetary policy, kind of akin to what uh, Jordi said, before things were a problem. Now in 2021, I think the, in, in 2021, the signs were on the wall, but the central banks had their eyes you know, elsewhere on other goals that aren't goals of the central banks. There were lots of people that claimed the, the shocks were transitory. The shocks were large too, so you have it maybe both ways. But it seems clear that the interest rate rise came you know, way after the inflation started to rise. So it seems there's a parallel maybe more to Volcker than to Greenspan, and I'm, I'm wondering whether you'd be willing to comment on that. Okay, uh, I'll be quick. Jordi, your comment on the, the graph where the inflation path is quite flat for most past historic cycles, um, isn't it? That's a, the graph that generated a lot of comments already and from feedback from Sintra. Uh, just a couple points on that. One is that is also the median and averages. When you do it for individual countries, you do get more dynamics. In some cases, not all though. Um, but overall, you're right. It, it, this would be, there's a number of possible reasons. One is a flatter Phillips curve, and one is just that monetary policy has largely worked pretty well in the past. We sort of see what's coming, you adjust in, in advance, and then you flatten the effect on inflation. So that is definitely consistent with that. Um, I'll jump to Harold. Uh, your comment, um, I, I don't think we can sort of comment on the, the strategy. One comment though is easing cycles have largely gotten longer. So it is just the tightening cycles that are shorter. Uh, whether that is complacency or large shocks, uh, that's a great research question that can now be answered with this database. So I'm happy to share it if you want to dig into that. Um, but then that also actually leads to Hoquins, your question. Um, the synchronization, what drives it? And also, again, the patterns of the cycles. There's, there's increased globalization, increased role of global factors. But that can be broken into two components. It's larger global shocks, which we document, and it's a larger similarity in the responses of central banks to a given global shock. So that is, it, those two drivers are important. And then looking for, and why are we all more connected? Sure, some of it is increased trade and globalization, but the role of the global factor increased even before the period of hyperglobalization. So I think there's more to it. I think some of it may be shared frameworks by central banks, some things like that, that will probably not go away. Um, but if you look again at what drives this increased global factor, large global shocks, even if we do desynchronize or break into groups, probably won't go away. We might get even bigger global shocks. Um, will central banks still respond in similar ways? Uh, that, it's not clear how that will evolve, but I'm not sure. 
I wouldn't expect this pattern of increased global factors to fade, given that some of it is just the size of the global shocks, which are bigger, and the world is still going to be, be very interconnected, even if it's interconnected in different ways than it is today. Paolo. A quick, a quick word just to clarify uh, with, with George, is government spending uh, inflationary depends on the composition uh, and depends on monetary policy. On the composition, we find that if it's uh, tilted towards public consumption and to less expand, uh, extent to public investment, is inflation in the short run. If it's tilted toward public R&D, we found that it's actually is not inflationary, actually it's, if anything is deflationary in the long run. And yes, monetary policy is super important. If we don't have interest rate, we get very different results, but we do have interest rate and we look at different subsample. So you can think of this result at the net of the res historical response of monetary policy. Thank you very much, Paolo. I think that we have time for two more questions, a couple of questions. Thanks a lot. Great presentation, uh, great uh, discussion. Um, uh, so, uh, Christine, I thought the, uh, the results on the increased importance of global shocks was very interesting, and I wonder if you thought about the role of, more specifically, the role of commodities in general for those results. So there are a number of papers showing that there's, you know, increased correlation across commodity prices due to financialization, etc. And so I wonder if that could play a role, and this is also important in, in the sense that there is also some evidence that uh, commodity prices might be correlated highly with inf inflation expectations. So I wonder also if you have any evidence internationally about the correlation of expectations and at the short end and, and also at the, at the long end. No. I'm Philip, Philip with Fenerbahce with you. Add to the point, please. <laughs> The speed and size of transmission monetary policy depends on private debt to GDP and also on the fraction of private debt that is at floating rate, um, at floating rates as opposed to fixed rates. So those factors could well influence the, size, the, the length of the, of the cycles that, that you're looking at. Very good. Philip? So I, I thought this was a, a, a very good paper. And as, as you said, Kristen, uh, it's going to feed a lot of future research. <laughs> uh, and uh, one, one element, which I don't think uh, you can answer now, well, unless <coughs> you find a very good way to do it, is the trade-off between the peak and the hold. Because essentially, um, it's always debated, do you go up uh, more steeply, knowing that that may bring inflation down more quickly, and therefore the hold will be lower, versus uh, maybe having a, a lower peak, but then needing to hold it for longer. So uh, I don't know in the history of this whether, what, what you can do about it. And as you say, you're not measuring the, the stance here uh, or, or the kind of uh, counterfactual, but just I suppose coming to what, what Harold said there, like in 2021, uh, absolutely, uh, we did have a sense uh, for a lot of 2021 that with the bottlenecks, uh, basically inflation would fall back as supply picked up. Uh, and now you can uh, argue about whether that was a, uh, a misdiagnosis or not. But of course, then there was a second shock in early 22. And it's really the, uh, the sequence of shocks between uh, 21 and 22, uh, which is, uh, I think, important for, for the real-time analysis. So this goes back to, to um, I mean, I, I think what you've done is, is all very sensible. Uh, but maybe within this data set, there are also ways to think about the different phases. The different phases because it's not just about turning points. It's about going from uh, accommodative to normal, from normal to tight and back again. Uh, and that kind of uh, more granular analysis is, is for, the, for the next time, I suppose. Okay, okay Christine. Yeah, I can be very quick. These are all fantastic suggestions we haven't done. Yeah, inflation expectations over 55 years, good luck. Um, <laughs> that would have to be a much narrower analysis. We did think about commodity prices, but you really can't identify those separately from oil. I think a lot of that is in the oil shock there, but you could definitely dig into that further. A speed of transmission, how long you hold versus how aggressively you tighten, those are all great questions, which I think are great for the next paper. We now have the data set that you can then analyze that, but I figured after 90 pages, that was probably enough for this paper, so that will be the, the next assignment. <laughs> I want to just second the, the John Mulbauer point. I think it's spot on. We know of international evidence showing that countries with higher 
household debt to GDP tends to have uh, a, a, a more amplified business cycle and to have, to have larger response of uh, uh, monetary policy and they have more variable rate, it is faster. So uh, um, actually this could be, and, and there are available data for your country and your panel for household debt to GDP, so it could be a nice addition to look at. I think it's a very good suggestion. Well, thank you very much to both of you. Without further ado, Piero, you are going to take the baton now and you deserve applause.